After witnessing the dramatic conclusion of the Final Fantasy VII Remake back in 2020, fans around the world have been desperate to learn more about this ambitious reimagining of the original game. At that point, serious questions remained about the direction of the story, how many parts the overarching project would contain, how the dynamic combat system would be evolved, and perhaps most intriguingly, how Zack Fair would fit into all of this. Over the past three years, we have received partial answers to many of these questions. We now know, for example, that 1. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth will act as the second instalment in a trilogy. 2. That even though things may seem out of kilter, according to Yoshinori Kitase, the story will remain faithful to the original. 3. That the combat system has plenty of room to grow, breathe, and get even better, as highlighted by episode intermission and that 4, Zack Fair has a significant role to play in whatever happens next. To date, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth has received three trailers. One during the Final Fantasy VII 25th Anniversary Celebration, one during the Summer Games Fest, and one just last week at the impromptu state of play. Each highlighted different aspects of what Rebirth will bring to the table, and we thoroughly enjoyed deep diving into each and every one of them. But be that as it may, there was still one thing missing. Seeing how those stylized trailers translated into reality. That void has now been filled, as we were recently invited by Square Enix to go hands-on with Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. So over the next 10 to 20 minutes, we'd recommend strapping yourselves in, as we're going to get into some pretty granular detail about what our hands-on session contained. Enjoy. The first thing worth noting is that Sephiroth is playable. This particular point has been the subject of much debate since the trailer dropped, as in the original game, Sephiroth was, of course, an autonomous AI-controlled ally who supported Cloud during the Nibelheim incident flashback sequence. There was also a precedent set with episode intermission, where Sonon was a supporting party member who could not be directly controlled. Tetsuya Nomura also seemed to confirm this stance when speaking with the PlayStation blog, noting, you will be able to control Sephiroth in the same scene in this title as you did in the original. Well, we're happy to say that it goes one step further. You can take direct control of Sephiroth during the Nibelheim flashback. That such a decision has been taken just shows how much confidence the development team has in their product. The combat system featured within Final Fantasy VII Remake is already held in such high regard, and based on what was shown during this gameplay session, it has been elevated. The way Sephiroth plays will serve as a prominent part of this evolution, just as Yuffie did during Episode Intermission, but it will also be demonstrated by modifications that have been made to Aerith for example, and the dynamism that will be introduced by the now playable Red 13. The original system was created under the supervision of Teruki Endo. Endo was brought into Square Enix with the specific objective of working on the Final Fantasy VII Remake. Prior to joining, Endo had been a core part of the Monster Hunter team. He served as a planner on Monster Hunter Tri and Monster Hunter 4, before serving as one of the two lead game designers on Monster Hunter World. Given that the Monster Hunter games are well renowned for their compelling and evergreen gameplay loop, there was a hope that Endo would be able to oversee the creation of a faithful yet forward-thinking combat system that would be appealing to series veterans and newcomers. That objective was achieved. But it was more so how the objective was achieved that became the most impressive element. Many of the core aspects from the original Final Fantasy VII, such as materia, summons and limit breaks returned, as did the command menu system that was so crucial during the days where the ATB system was king. That venerable system also returned with a modern twist. Players could only perform more powerful abilities or use magic and items when their ATB gauge was full enough. This would charge autonomously over time, just like the ATB systems of old, but the speed of charge could also be influenced by landing regular attacks. These elements meant the system retained the illusion of being a traditional ATB system, where players would need to wait to perform actions but it was grounded in everything being real-time, which made the whole thing much more engaging. 
The true beauty of this system, however, was how different every character felt. They could still equip the same materia, just like the original game, but their movement, regular attacks, abilities, and limit breaks made each character feel inherently unique. Now, the original game only contained four characters, Cloud, Barrett, Tifa, and Aerith. This was then expanded to five with the episode Intermission, as players were granted access to Yuffie. But with the Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, it will now be pushed up to at least eight, as Red 13, Ketch Shi, and Sephiroth will be added to the playable roster. And who knows if there will be more, as there's the potential for Zack, Sid, and Vincent to also be playable in some shape or form. What's perhaps most impressive is that the uniqueness has continued. When Episode Intermission launched and everyone saw how Yuffie played, there was a sense that anything will be possible with this combat system. It just felt so malleable. And based on what we saw within our play session, where focus was placed on new characters such as Sephiroth and Red 13, that notion of malleability has been retained. Sephiroth, for example, oozes power. But what's impressive is how that power manifests through the combat system. As with every other character, Sephiroth can perform standard strikes to fill the ATB bar quicker. But that's where the similarities end. Alongside filling the ATB bar, each strike also fills Sephiroth's aura charge. Once enough charge has been accrued, Sephiroth can then perform what the game classifies as branching finishes, such as Shift Slash, Sword Dance, and Telluric Fury. And alongside delivering a powerful blow, these finishes, which are accessible by pressing the triangle button at the right time, charge Sephiroth's limit gauge faster. Sephiroth can also hold down the standard attack button to switch between delivering shorter range attacks to punishing airborne or far off foes with a powerful ranged attack. These modifications to standard gameplay are compelling in themselves, but Sephiroth truly shines when using retaliation stance. This is activated by pressing R1, the button most often associated with guarding. For Sephiroth, this is turned into an offensive stance, as when retaliation stance is engaged, the player can press square to parry an incoming attack, opening the door for punishment to be rained down on the unfortunate adversary. It's a very cool mechanic, as it adds an extra layer of depth to the combat for those who want it. But the real reason why retaliation stance shines is that it makes perfect narrative sense. And this highlights just how much care and attention has been placed on developing this aspect of Rebirth. To break this down, what makes Retaliation Stance special is that it serves as an evolution of Punisher Mode, which was adopted by Cloud within Remake and Zack within Crisis Core Reunion. Punisher Mode served and continues to serve as an alternate battle stance, allowing Cloud and Zack to deliver much stronger attacks but it also allowed them to deliver a counter if an incoming strike was blocked. The major difference, however, was that this counter was automatic. The player would simply need to hold down R1 while Punisher Mode was activated. The developers could have replicated this for Sephiroth, but he's a step up in terms of skill. And to emphasize this, a clear effort has been made to demand a step up in skill from the player too, by making them not just press R1 to parry the strike, but press and hold R1 and then press square at the right moment. Sephiroth also has access to some quintessential abilities which can be performed by spending ATB bars. Zanshin, for example, launches waves of energy at the proposed target just as when fighting against Sephiroth at the end of Remake, and Hellskade sees Sephiroth perform his classic move, jumping up so as to land an impaling downward thrust on the target. The coup de grace is then Octa Slash, which serves as Sephiroth's limit break. Red 13 has received a similar level of care and attention, with emphasis placed on mobility and the character's bestial nature. What this means is that even though Red 13 can use standard evasion, traversal around the combat space in general feels fast and efficient. This then dovetails with standard attacks that feel quick and easy to land. The net result is that even though the basic functions remain the same, Playing as Red 13 just feels different. The uniqueness then comes from Vengeance Mode. Similar to Sephiroth, Red 13's triangle move cannot be initiated unless something else has happened first. In the case of Sephiroth, this was landing standard attacks to increase the aura charge, but in the case of Red 13, it's guarding against attacks. Every successful strike guarded against will lead to the Vengeance gauge increasing, 
and Red 13 can also make use of an ability called Sentinel Stance to amplify this effect, while also delivering a Counter Strike after damage has been absorbed. After the Vengeance Gauge has increased by a sufficient margin, it can then be turned into Siphon Fang, a powerful move that allows Red 13 to deal more damage but also absorb HP upon every successful hit. This functionality is then supplemented by core damage dealing abilities such as Sidewinder and Stardust Ray and Crescent Claw, which when used while in Vengeance mode will replete what remains of the Vengeance Gauge to deal more damage at an increased range. Based on this, it feels as though Red 13 will suit more advanced players, as there will be numerous elements to be mindful of. To maximise damage output, it won't just be a case of hitting attack and landing abilities, players will instead need to be more thoughtful, creating strategies to ensure they can be an effective tank so that they can then dish out some much needed vengeance. In addition to these new characters, the combat system of Rebirth has also been enhanced through the use of synergy attacks. A version of this system was introduced in Episode Intermission. As players could only control Yuffie, the synergy mechanic was crucial for ensuring players still felt like Sonon was an active part of the combat setting. But with Rebirth, the system has been overhauled and expanded. There will now be two types of synergy attack, and both will be dynamic depending on who's in the party. The first can be used as part of the general flow of combat. These are called synergy skills, and they can be initiated by holding down R1 and selecting the appropriate skill from the list. The second is synergy abilities, and these require synergy bars to be used. Bars can be seen just below the ATB bar as little pips and within the Synergy Skills command menu, you can see how many of these pips are required to perform a specific move. Not only do these skills deliver a ton of damage, but after their successful completion, the respective characters involved will have their limit levels increased, making them a valuable part of the overall combat system. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth will also introduce a whole host of new materia, and some of them serve to highlight how certain aspects of this particular system have been refined. It was always assumed that new materia would be introduced, as Remake only scratched the surface when it came to materia that were available in the original game. But due to Remake also introducing original materia, the volume available within that game ended up being quite substantial. That volume will increase with Rebirth, and there are bound to be some casualties in terms of materia from Remake not returning. But as the number of slots available to equip materia in won't be increasing, and what we're going to see from here on out will only become more sophisticated and attractive, effort has been placed on creating ways to reduce people agonising over their choices. One of the more creative instances of this comes through materia combinations. You can still equip fire, ice and lightning as isolated materia. But for the sake of efficiency, you will also now be able to find and equip materia that combines elements. One such example of this was the Lightning and Wind Materia that can cast magic attuned to those specific elements with a single cast. Further to this, there will also be a wider array of multi-purpose materia related to positive and negative status effects. And apologies for not being able to show specific visual evidence of this within the video, you'll just have to trust us. The Fortification Materia will, for example, allow for the casting of Protect and Shell. Empowerment can be equipped to grant access to Faith and Bravery, and Innovation will allow for the casting of Deprotect and Deshell. For those who want a bit more autonomy, a variety of Auto Materia will also be introduced, with one example being Auto Unique that will allow an ally character to automatically use abilities without your input. Beyond that, a lot more thought has also been put into general utility and different playstyles, and this was evidenced through the introduction of new independent materia such as Level Boost, which will automatically upgrade the level of any linked materia, and Limit Siphon, which allows an ally to share their limit gauge. With the introduction of other, more traditional materia such as Comet, it feels like Rebirth will offer an absolute boatload of potential combinations. Now, due to there being so many potential pieces of materia and potential playable characters, the development team have also implemented an active party switching mechanic, and this feature deserves special mention. Whenever the party is in the field, it's possible to switch between party configurations on the fly. There are up to three slots available here, and they contain any combination of characters. It's why, when running around the world maps, you will see the entire group in tow as opposed to just those within the current active party. 
it cannot be understated how useful this feature will be, as you'll be able to adapt to specific upcoming encounters within seconds. And this will be possible without having to go through a ton of different menu options. You just cycle through party configurations as you would party members within a combat setting. With Rebirth featuring a much more expanded field, this will then become crucial as it will allow players to take advantage of each character's strengths. And this is perhaps most evident through what have been dubbed world activities. When wandering around the field, random encounters will not be all that plentiful it doesn't seem. This was similar to within Remake, but it made sense there due to how small and narrow the environments were. That's not to say there won't still be random packs of enemies found throughout the world in Rebirth, but there will also be specific fiend sightings that are marked on the map. These feel akin to hunts or marks as they are amplified versions of existing enemies, but instead of being singular enemies, within the segment we played they were always groups of enemies. Each fiend sighting will have a small piece of intel provided by a character called Mai, and Mai will also provide objectives for each encounter, such as needing to pressure an enemy, stagger an enemy, and defeat enemies within a specific period of time. The more objectives completed, the more regional data is collected, although it's unclear at this point the extent of this mechanic and how it's initiated. For the purposes of the demo, a small sample of exploration was provided for the space outside of Juno, but even that was much more expansive than anything found within Remake. You're able to mount chocobos whenever you want and traverse around the map without any strict corridors to guide you. Even though this was a small segment, there were five fiend sightings present and different locations to visit as well, such as a small farm known as Gabe's Ranch. This served as a small safe haven where you can stock up on supplies and even indulge via the Choco Boutique. For those who love glamour systems, the Choco Boutique will be a welcome distraction as you can dress your Chocobo up with different helmets, breastplates and greaves and there's also the ability to adjust colours to suit any specific tastes. Chocobos will also be crucial for making use of Rebirth's enhanced exploration capabilities as they can run fast, climb, fly and even swim. This then grants access to some hidden locations that are off the beaten path. By exploring, you will also be able to gather materials that can be used for crafting. It's unclear how detailed this system will be, but by using the item transmitter, it's possible to craft items such as potions and high potions, as well as cushions, which allow the player to make use of rest stops that are in a state of disrepair. Given that this was only a small sample, and there were clear barriers put in place for this demonstration to stop us exploring further, it stands to reason that the critiques Remake had were taken to heart, and that the developers want the wider world to feel like a vibrant place. What they showed was promising, but the real questions will relate to how much of the game actually adheres to this style of gameplay, where players can run off and explore at their own pace in an open world environment, and how much of it relates to specific set piece passages like the Mount Nibble segment where Cloud was playable alongside Sephiroth. One thing does remain clear however, Rebirth will continue where Remake left off with regards to developing a compelling adaptation of the original story. This was one of the real strengths of Remake, as without getting into the subject of whispers and how the conclusion of the game diverged from what was expected, there were some real standout moments. Remake depicted events in realistic and respectful ways, and we got to see the same level of care here with the conclusion of the Junin segment of the demonstration. This all took place in Lower Junin. First off, the way Lower Junin was displayed from a visual perspective was on point. You could see the struggle of the town and its citizens as they attempted to deal with the issues created by the continued expansion of Upper Junin. As we saw with Remake, this was brought to life by the introduction of some original characters. In this case, a woman named Rhonda who serves as the mayor and sheriff of Lower Junin. But we also got to see the appearance of Priscilla and perhaps most importantly, Mr. Dolphin. As in the original game, the party would subsequently have to deal with a powerful enemy called Terror of the Deep, aka Bottomswell, and this sequence was used in Rebirth as a way of introducing the party to Yuffie, although how and why Yuffie ended up in that situation remains to be seen. The fight itself was then dynamic and engaging, as Terror of the Deep manipulated the environment in its favour, and the encounter rounded out with something that was both tacky and awesome at the same time. Cloud teaming up with Mr. Dolphin to land the final blow. That in itself shows the level of commitment the narrative team has to ensuring Final Fantasy VII Rebirth delivers on everything fans of the original are looking for. 
And with everything else that's been revealed within the recent trailer and information dumps, which included mini games, more focus on Zack, and the news that Rebirth will conclude with the fated events of the Forgotten Capital, it means there is a lot to look forward to. The good thing is that there's not too long to wait. As of right now, there are 161 days until the launch of Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. That's less than 6 months, or apparently only 44.11% of a common year, if we're getting specific. And based on how everything seems to go these days, the 29th of February 2024 will arrive before we even have time to blink. Either way, we hope you found this extensive hands-on preview interesting. Be sure to let us know in the comments below which aspect of Rebirth you've been most impressed with so far. And if you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more content. Alright everyone, with that, this is Daryl signing out. As always, I'd like to give a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, especially Adam Aguilara, Arguan, Benjamin Snow, The Livestream, Gaussian D. Kajata, Gregory, Justin Dent, and Zukan TDK, who are super special Onion Eye supporters. And of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.